four. This is one more. Hello and welcome to episodio número 26 of Otra por favor. Otra por favor. 26, 25, ¿cuál? 26. 26. So, right? 26. Yeah, 26. ¿Cómo están todos? Bien, bien. ¿Cómo, ¿Cómo les va? Bien, bien. Estoy acostumbrándome a decir cómo están todos, porque antes decía cómo está Chaparro, porque uh -huh. éramos tú y yo solos. Sí. <risa> Pero Coque uh, anda de vacaciones. ¿En dónde estás, Coque? In Casita. I am uh, doing this remotely due to some unforeseen conditions, but I'm happy to I'm happy to be with you guys. Yeah, thank you for you know for joining us, Koke. And yes, sir. Uh, we have another special guest in the house today. Uh, like all of our guests that we've invited, uh, he's actually an Austin native. Um, he played for several teams in Mexico and also for the Bold. He's he's I would say uh, a living legend. Yes. Would you say, would you agree with me or not, Chaparro? Yeah, I think so. I yeah. think so, yeah. He, he might say like, nah, nah, nah. But you he's know, humble, he, he's humble, he's that's humble. why. Yeah. Not, not a legend. <laughs> 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 so, so with us and this evening is Sonny Guadarrama. Thank you guys for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. How How is everything for you today, Sonny? Bien. Should I be Spanglish? English, man, Espanol, lo que caiga. Me confundo. Sí. Nah, <laughs> Whatever you feel more comfortable, man. Whatever you feel more Espanol. comfortable. Hey, me a mí me pasa todo el tiempo, so we're good. Yeah, we're, yeah. we're, we're not going to be like, oh, man, why not? We put the bilingual part at the beginning of, like, the description so people will know it's going to be bilingual. Yes. So, so from that, they'll know. Whatever comes out. Yeah. Yeah, whatever comes out. Sometimes I forget Spanish and sometimes I forget <laughs> English. So I just throw it in there. Yeah, there we go. Hey, it's just good, same here, I can same. relate. I can relate to that for sure. Yeah. Here, especially when we go camping, Coke forgets Spanish. <laughs> That's a different topic. Though. <laughs> There's another. This, this story a, behind yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. yeah, well, we'll have to like tell you why we, you know, we have that one. Uh, so, Sony, um, before we get started, can you share with the audience or the listeners a little bit about you? Your where you're from originally? Obviously, you're from Austin. Um, where what part of Austin did you grow up in? Yeah, so um, I grew up, I was born here in Austin, St. David's Hospital, and my parents lived in Cedar Park, Texas, so that's where I grew up, North Austin, before it was even called North Austin. Cedar Park was far away from Austin and felt like we were pretty far at the time, but now Cedar Park's very much a, a, a good part of Austin right now. Nice. Yeah. Shout out Cedar Park, man. I actually... Uh, <laughs> live live here right now so oh. it's uh cool hearing that, that you grew up here I, i'm wondering what that what that was like um not the, the same, early soccer sure. days <laughs> i grew up in cedar park when it was growing for sure because every yeah. year i had to go to a new elementary so i never mm -hmm. went to the same elementary because cedar park was growing so fast that they were just popping up with elementaries and for whatever reason our neighborhood was like okay you're going to this elementary no now you're going to this one so i went to five different elementaries Growing up, because Cedar Park was just growing so fast at the time. Dang, yeah, that's, that's tough. I yeah. mean, all your friends every every year, different well, friends. Luckily, the people that were on our bus, because yeah. obviously my parents weren't going to drive us to school. <laughs> <laughs> we had to ride the bus because there's four of us. It builds character. Have, that's right. <laughs> I have two brothers and a sister. Um, but whenever we would coincide at the same schools, we'd all ride the same bus. So everybody that was kind of in our neighborhood went to the same mm. school. So at least that helped. Yeah. That's good. That's good. And growing up in Cedar Park is a suburb of Austin, and it's like kind of like Houston has Lake City, where it's different. Uh, it's not literally Houston, but a lot of people still call it the Houston area. So I'm pretty sure it's its own city, or it was its own environment back in the days. I mean, it was definitely a suburb, like outside the city. Mm -hmm. um, there wasn't a lot happening in Cedar Park, other than growth in houses but i mean for me it was home so i was happy to to be in cedar park okay and come from say as you grew up how moving f like to five different schools when you were in elementary how did that uh, shape who you are as a person right now 
Um, it's kind of like the soccer mentality. The soccer mentality is the game's over, you forget about it, and you move on to the next thing. And that's just kind of the way I live my life. Like a problem can come, it's over, move on to the next thing. It could be something great. Like I'm excited for it, it's over, and move on to the next thing. Because that's just kind of how your mind gets wired mm -hmm. when you start to play because you can't dwell really on much of anything because the next opportunity is coming up so that's kind of i don't know if my parents put that into me or, or what but that's just how i kind of still live my life of not really worrying about what's coming up and just moving on to the next thing um growing up it helped it's not like soccer was popular back then mm -hmm. But if you were good at something, it helped. So I was athletic, probably because I played so much soccer. So we never played soccer in elementary. I don't remember. But we'd play football and basketball. So I could keep up playing all the sports. So it made me like, okay, well, I can have friends because I'm the ath one of the athletic kids in the school. So it, it definitely helped that I trained a lot of soccer at a young age. So when I went into elementary and middle school, I was known like, oh, this is the kid that plays soccer but he can also play other sports because he's quick and fast. Did you play football? I loved playing football. I, I begged my parents to let me play high school football, not not to do anything other than kick because our team was actually pretty good, and I was like, I get to play. I would just, for fun, shoot one with the right and shoot one with the left just to make people <laughs> upset. <laughs> and they were like, my dad was like, no, you're, you're not going to play. So my dad never let me play any other sport. Besides karate and cross country. And that was only because it was going to help me be a better soccer player. Okay. That's crazy. So you, your dad, he didn't, he never played soccer either? He, he didn't? No, my dad played soccer and my dad would grew up in Acuna, Coahuila. Uh -huh. So it's such a small city. There's not really anything close to Acuna. So you have to play every sport. And he was one of nine children and there was a lot of guys i have a lot of deals so they all played like if it was baseball they were like half the baseball team if it was like running track they all ran <laughs> track if it was soccer <laughs> they all played soccer so they were all huh. together and any sport that they invited they played and then he said well when i have kids i wasn't good enough at any sport really because i played so many sports mm -hmm. my kids are just going to play one sport gotcha. so his mission probably from us being born was I want to have kids that play professional soccer. That's good. That's good. What do you think? Oh. Okay. No, I think that's the, that's very fascinating, man. I'm interested to know as like a first uh, generation American myself, you know, what, what uh, ended up, how did your family end up coming to Cedar park of all places? What, what made them choose this area and um, start a life here? It's a, it's a good story. I'm a second generation Austinite. So my mom was actually born in Austin too. Um, her parents, my grandparents um, are from Ciudad Victoria, Tamaulipas. Mm -hmm. But for whatever reason, they moved to Austin. And my dad was playing a soccer tournament at Zilker Park. And my grandpa had a soccer team here in Austin that he was kind of like in charge of. And I guess they brought a team from Mexico and my dad was on the team and that's how he ends up meeting my mom wow. at like <laughs> Silver like Park at like a soccer tournament, mm -hmm. like a wow. men's league soccer tournament, I guess. So Zilker Park, I mean, Zilker Park now, I don't, are y'all from Austin? No, I'm not. Well, I, I've been lived here for a while. You've yeah, you been here for a while. Like 2015? Yeah. 2000. So that's we've, all, time. we've all lived here long enough to basically consider ourselves Austinites. But you would have never seen Zilker Park as where people played soccer. That was the only Place. major Place. soccer complex in Austin, okay. Zilker Park. Really? So growing up, and my dad tells me that he played soccer at Zilker Park with 10 teams. There was a 10-team league in Zilker Park in 1978. Dang. Wow. wow. That's, that's amazing. <laughs> it is. So you're, you're, that's some history right yeah. there. <laughs> it is. And so me growing up, there wasn't – like I played for Flyers, which – trained at Justin Lane, which is like a small one field and a half. Mm -hmm. But all of our games, for the most part, were played at Zilker Park. Mm -hmm. And Chivas and Atlas would come every year to play in a tournament at Zilker Park. Wow. 
What? So like Carlos Carlos Vela came at one point, and anybody who's came out of Chivas Ratlas that's around my age mm -hmm. came to Austin to play in the tournament because they would always come every year. Was it just like a friendly tournament, or no, it was like a youth soccer tournament? Oh yeah. That they hosted. Can you get a little closer? Sorry. To there we go. That's better. <laughs> Um, no, it was just like a normal, a normal youth tournament? soccer tournament that oh, they would wow. come in on yeah. a bus and they'd come play here. That's so Zoker Park crazy. had like eight fields. I mean, it's a big park, so it's I can't imagine. Yeah, yeah, but I, I I have never heard. Of, this is the first time I'm hearing something like that about soccer. That's, That's crazy. Soccer now is only ACL. Pick up, pick up soccer ACL too. And pick up, like <laughs> they won't let anybody. Pick up on. soccer, ACL, know, Trail of Lights. It, right. It's always close. No, <laughs> but but the one thing is, we were actually talking about, uh, like pick up soccer and soccer in Austin. How there's a huge history behind it because a lot of people play. But the city itself, unless you pay for you know a park to get fixed. They don't really have designated soccer fields for people to go in and play. Like we've been playing at, at Bailey's in Comal. A lot of those fields, I mean, they're not the best. Like I'm, I don't mind it, but like lighting during the winter, um, you're there. I mean, that's it's the only one that's available. Yeah. And I would say for how how many people show up to soccer to play soccer, it's kind of like the city is like they're, they don't they don't put any effort to to accommodate. And from what I hear is a lot of the guys that play at Silker, when it, where the fall comes in winter, they stop playing until they go back in the spring. It's like warms up again. Yeah. yeah. And I just, for me, it's, I wish I wish the city could do more for, I mean, it's, if we're growing as a soccer community, like it should be in general, not just a team, not just, you know, Austin FC. You're preaching to the choir. Every time I see baseball fields that are completely empty, I'm like, oh, how many I people know. could be playing baseball here? Exactly. I never see anybody there. Why aren't there more soccer fields? And they have lights, right, and it's right. city run and city fu city funded. I'm just like, I don't get it. Yeah. yeah not 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 to knock those other sports, but right. Right. plenty of empty baseball fields. Huge amount. Don't even get me started with golf. <laughs> golf has like the biggest biggest size of land and infrastructure, but it's played by like a select few people, you know. It's not really the the sport that you that you see people gathering around and creating a large community out of like soccer. Um, it's, it's just my two it's cents. It's crazy right there. too because you're saying that back then there was a lot of soccer going on in a way, right? Especially youth leagues. That was and, the only thing going on at soccer oh, park. Okay, I don't even remember watching another sport because that could be park. that could be what why we don't have really a lot of uh, fields to play and 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 they have all their like baseball and and, and golf fields better than soccer you no know? but that was the only one really? i don't think that that was like they i think that's just where the luck landed that we had like the best property in austin <laughs> to play soccer games but not because they were like planning oh we're gonna have zoker park for soccer fields there was nowhere to play really yeah. very few complexes right. had soccer fields growing up man we sh we sh are you gonna run for for a city council or something <laughs> one day you you have to I, I'm, pre I'm pretty sure you can uh get the boats <laughs> like especially from everyone that plays soccer <laughs> that's true you get it for sure. you're gonna yeah. be able to you know bring in proposals and a hey, show a picture of carlos bella and like this could <laughs> this could have been us <laughs> well i would just ask <laughs> for fairness yeah if there's a certain amount of baseball fields and there should be a certain amount of soccer fields whatever sport warrants right. the amount of players then they should have more of access to get to field so that's it on that part <laughs> that's crazy right I, I didn't i didn't i never heard about that like i know i was surprised too like that's that's a good story to tell yeah, actually yeah right. so then you learned pretty much your dad would play in tournaments and he you grew up with him you know hey encourage encouraging you to play soccer and when, when, like I would say, do you re recall in a specific time you were like, okay, this is like what I want to do for the rest of my life? That's a long story <laughs> of questions. Hey, we got I'll, time. I'll, so. I'll try and sum it up as best as I can. S my dad was 100% committed to us being professional soccer players. Mm -hmm. And I'm would go out on a limb and say for somebody to make it, you have to have a parent, at least one, I have two parents, that were 100% committed in, in you making it because not only is am I going to sacrifice my time, but my parents definitely have to sacrifice a lot of time 
for one to train enough hours to be able to be good at it. Um, my dad stopped playing soccer when he had us, so he could just train us, basically. He would go to work and come home, and we train with him every day. Like, if Zilk, if I, that told you that story of Zilker Park told you anything about soccer in Austin, there wasn't a lot of soccer being played in Austin. Mm-hmm. Um, what helped me a lot was that I had two older brothers that played soccer. So we grew up playing out in Leander Youth Soccer Association, back when the the games changed completely you could only play like soccer you could play soccer but you couldn't play select soccer till you were like 11 so everything was rec soccer there wasn't any competitive soccer going on until you hit 11 and you could start playing select soccer and select soccer was 11 v 11 Mm -hmm. so you were like itty bitty playing on a huge soccer field and now they've changed. Like when you're that age, you're playing 9v9. First you start 7v7, then 9v9, and then you move to 11v11. That didn't really exist growing up. So we played soccer at uh, Leander Youth Soccer Association, but my dad had me playing up since I was like two. <laughs> two, I would, since there wasn't a lot of kids playing, yeah. he would coach the team. Both my brothers would be on the team, and then he would stick me on the team. <laughs> and Cachirul. <laughs> on, the, on the other end <laughs> and i used to have video somewhere but i wouldn't even touch the ball mm-hmm. i was just kind of like out there just kind of rummaging the field you were the youngest i was the youngest by far it was like a u6 league and i was two mm-hmm. playing um and that's kind of my dad would always coach all of our teams growing up but what my dad did do is he built like a room I, I say I grew up in the ghetto of Cedar Park, which is kind of hard to believe <laughs> since you know Cedar Park now. But I, I'll yeah. take you to my house in your imagination. If you go down <coughs> old 183A, like, sorry, not yep. just 183, and you see the Goodwill that's on the right. I live right by that Goodwill. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you take a right at the Goodwill, and then yeah. you don't get up on the ramp to go to, like, 183A into Brushy Creek, but you keep going straight, you'll hit – Buffalo mm-hmm. Avenue. It's okay. like trailer parks in Cedar Park. It's like the last probably trailer parks that are left in Cedar Park. That's probably worth a gotcha. lot more money, but they're all trailer parks. And it backs up to 183A. Mm-hmm. So that's where I grew up. But my dad, because he knew that we needed a place to train, built a concrete room behind the house. Mm-hmm. I'm talking about like a room with like a roof over it and three walls were concrete in the back was like sheetrock or I don't know what it was, but something hard enough that you could bounce the ball. So we were there every day training inside this room constantly behind the room. He built us a full size soccer goal out of wood. Mm -hmm. And then we had probably about like 25 yards worth of space of grass in the back. And that's where we were almost every single day training, training, training because like rec soccer would train like once a week mm-hmm. growing up. So that wasn't enough. And there was that competition. There, there was no competition. Yeah. I mean, Cedar Park, 1994, there wasn't like a lot of people interested in playing soccer yeah. back then. Um, so it was all because really my dad would train us so much and I had older brothers to play against that I started to get better at soccer. Mm-hmm. Um knew from a young age that I was pretty good, but I knew that I always wanted to play soccer because we would sit down. There was only one game of soccer on TV each week, and it was Sundays, <laughs> and it was usually Santos because they would always play on Sundays at 5 o'clock, and then we would stay up till 10 o'clock at night to watch. Um, it was like a Telemundo 30-minute segment <laughs> with Andres Cantor. <laughs> And they had, like, a segment called Goles, 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 and we would just wait to see, like, goals from Spain, from England, from wherever, because that was, like, the only soccer that you could get. I'm going with the leagues, right? That's Yeah, because there wasn't any soccer going on on TV. So we would wait for that, and that's kind of like, okay, I want to be a professional soccer player from that young age. Then just kind of things started moving towards that direction. I remember... Back in the days, like even the two thousands, I mean, you would only have Univision would only do one game, and that was 
the 12 o'clock one the Pumas or Atlante whenever Atlante will play a Sulgrana. Univision, you said, right? Univision. Yeah. After they moved from Azteca. And then they added another time slot as Galavision started taking more, like, pretty much as Televisa. Mm -hmm. And then from that, you get to see more teams. So then little by little, Univision started getting more soccer, you know, like oriented. So they started adding more games. But back in the days, there was only one game, and like for the Mexican League and, and a Sunday, and one random game from somewhere in Europe on a Saturday afternoon. Like I remember seeing Roma against yeah. uh, Calgary. They would show like more Italian, I think, uh, yeah. Yeah. games. Well, I, I think at that part, uh, at that time, I think the, the Liga Italiana was the one hitting all of them. That was the so, top league yeah, at the time. Top league, I think, yeah. <laughs> With Gattuso and all of them. <laughs> Gattuso, yeah. that's right. So that's crazy how your dad accommodated everything so you guys can train. No excuses. He left yeah. us nothing to to be able to chance it. But yeah, he would come home from construction, which is not easy. Tired. And, and come home just to train us. <laughs> Didn't matter how tired he was or what time it was. So he definitely made it his mission for us to to be able to do something with their lives. I have a question. So you were the youngest right of the brothers that played was your dad the same way with them before you were born or, or, or he was he my was. oldest brother quit soccer because he thought my dad was too hard on him oh man yeah my other brother also played professional soccer mm -hmm. so we had i have two i have another brother that played professional soccer he is had better natural abilities than i did but i worked twice as hard as he did mm -hmm. Ves Chaparro, le echas ganas y juegas bien, güey. No va bien no, por sí. eso. Yo siempre te digo que las ganas las respeto mucho porque necesitas mucho de eso. Yeah, I'm not talented on my own at all. There's nothing special about five foot, nothing, <laughs> average speed, maybe a little bit quickness, but it's all hard work, really. Mm. That's, mm -hmm. That's Coco's motto right there. Yeah. All day, every day. <laughs> For sure, man. That's something that I that I greatly admire from you, Sonny. Um, it's interesting that at a, throughout all, all odds, you know, someone, a family in Cedar Park of all places in, a, in an environment in a time when soccer was very low in popularity, very low competition level. Your, your dad built this environment with your brothers that allowed you to kind of push yourself and, and achieve something in the soccer world where um, some would say, it's kind of against against many odds so what 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 do you think um because everybody has the dream right we all played at some point and we think oh my gosh if we got paid to do this this is a dream so like what what, what differentiated you and what allowed you to get to those extra levels of competition um compared to some of your other peers i would probably use the word relentless as like a kid I took kind of everything personal. If I thought somebody or somebody thought that they were better than I was, it just drove me to train even harder and harder and harder. And there wasn't a lot of kids, even now, I, I still like coach kids. It's hard to find kids that want to train on their own. I know my dad was there training us, but also like I had to put in the effort my dad could say, like, oh, let's train every day. But if the kid doesn't want to train, then yeah. you're going to get right. anything done. Your heart's got to be in it, yeah. for sure. Yeah. So it's hard to find that person that just has that drive as a young age. And I probably missed out on a lot of, like, normal activities, like hanging out with friends and going to the movies and doing this and having vacations. All of our vacations were soccer tournaments in, like, another city or another state. Um not really like I can't even say I would have like that many friends from high school because I didn't spend that much time like doing normal things because I was always training soccer stuff. So it was one for the other. That's why probably a lot of people don't want to do it. And parents are like, no, he needs like a normal life. Um, let him have fun and do whatever. I just wanted to train and be a professional soccer player. What? Uh, oh, go ahead. Okay. Oh, I was going to follow up and say, 
um, growing up, you probably had a few players or coaches uh, that you really looked up to and then kind of tried to shape your game. You know, what can you describe some of those um, players that you looked up to, or maybe even uh, into your career that kind of sh- uh, shaped a little bit of your game? I can. So let's do the coaches first. I had obviously my dad, I would consider him my first coach. What he couldn't do because he never played professional soccer, so he didn't know like. He taught me everything he knew, mm-hmm. but there came like a point where, okay, I've probably absorbed all of everything that he's taught me. So when I played for Flyers, I had Luis Papandrea as my coach, which a lot of people probably don't know about him if you're from Austin recently, but he was one of the first professional soccer players in Austin that came to live here in Austin. He was very tough and very strict but he just had a way of like it's probably where I got like some of my meanness from because he okay. was just like an a, he's an Argentinian defender like how can you not be mean it's really and tough. be like mm, Argentinian yeah. and the way he trained he literally would stand in the middle of the field and have all the kids out on the field and he'd be doing moves and we'd all have to like copy him and he would just like walk around and be strict and like you're not doing it right do it this way and I want it perfect and his demeanor, some people got offended by him because he was a winner. And winning is offensive to some people because you almost have to look for perfection. And perfection is, like, hard to get to. So you're constantly on top of people. And he was constantly on top of us, and he would want things perfect. And he brought, like, another side of my game that I didn't have. And then I was fortunate enough to have Wolfgang also as one of my coaches who played for Bayern Munich, played for the Cosmos, another player that had a different type of game because he was a German soccer player, had a different flair to the way he thought about soccer and gave me other pointers. And he really opened up a lot of doors for me as a player because at the time that I was growing up, he was the U20 national team coach. So he had like Landon Donovan and Demarcus Beasley as players that were they were nobodies when he had them. They were just two really good players that went and played for him. So he opened the door for me to go to the national team, and I will always ever be grateful to him and the doors that he opened up. For the players, I go back to there wasn't even enough soccer to even have favorite players. I mean, we got to see Zidane like, do moves and score goals, but you didn't ever get to like study a player because there wasn't anything to study because there's no games to study. Mm-hmm. We would only wait for the World Cup to sh- like come on because that was when they would show almost okay. every game was with the World Cup. Right. So this is going to – I mean, I would I loved Landon Donovan and Cuauhtémoc Blanco. Those were my, wow. Those were my two favorite field players. Yeah. But I also loved watching Osvaldo Sanchez. Oh, yeah. I mean, I'm not a goalie, but – his like winning mentality when he was on the national team and he would save like miracle saves and fly. I was like, geez, this guy's amazing. And we'd wake up Japan, Korea, like two thirty in the morning just to watch to watch the games. Yeah, for sure. Mexico, <laughs> in the living room. How um, with uh, speaking of Japan and Korea, what do you? How did you feel about the Mexico USA game? And how Mexico was eliminated in that World Cup. And Josh Phillips scored one of the goals. But Joshua scored in Columbus against Mexico. Uh-huh. He didn't score in the World Cup. He didn't? I thought he did. No, I think Landon Donovan scored, Landon Donovan scored one. a header. Mm-hmm. And I think Brian McBride scored, scored the, other, the other goal. Okay. For me, it was like, I don't care who wins. Because I'm gonna win either way. <laughs> it, I'm right. gonna. I, I enjoy it's a win-win, the baby. Watch and play, and if Mexico goes on, I enjoy watching Mexico play. There wasn't a lot of people who cared really about the U.S. at the time. I don't think Mexico games. We were all sitting in front of the TV watching, like my whole family. U.S. games. We would just sh- wake up to watch the games because we're American and we want to see the U.S. team. And Landon Donovan was like 18 at the time or 19 which is hard to believe like mm-hmm. he was young and yeah. and he was probably one of like cuál <coughs> referente en el equipo right. they like looked to him to to score goals and he did at the young age so it's, that's why he's 
his attitude. Cuauhtémoc's like, me vale todo attitude. I can be f- fat, really, <laughs> and, and still bring like this edge to my game just because of the mental side that mm-hmm. he brought. Like, I'm better than everybody. I don't care. I'm going to try this. I'm going to try that. And same with Osvaldo. He's like the no-lose mentality as a goalie. So those are the three people that I looked up to the most. Well, even Osvaldo, he sometimes seemed like he would get butthurt when he would lose. But nah, that's just like him having that passion of he didn't want to lose. Um, If he didn't have that, he wouldn't be Osvaldo. He wouldn't probably work hard enough. Because he probably, he did, Mm -hmm. he ends up being my teammate later on in my career. And he hated to lose in everything. It could be tiro a gol and he wanted to not let anybody score any time and not even in training not even in training That's Man. Cool. and did you ever play with Cuauhtémoc Blanco or against Cuauhtémoc against Cuauhtémoc Blanco how was he like on the field against did you like talk back to him talk you know talk trash <laughs> to him back or no I don't talk, I don't talk <laughs> trash to him no but like <laughs> but I definitely go in hard I don't care yeah. who it is yeah. I would <laughs> try and hit him if I could if I could catch up to him but he's just He's just two steps ahead of everybody else. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of like Chaparro right here. He's always... <laughs> no, literally, this guy right here, he could have been a pro. Even Koke. Like you said, I we're, didn't... We're in I our didn't 30s didn't right know. now, but I, I would say, he, <laughs> like, this dude right here would have been... Yo soy más como de portero, de... Si necesitan un jugador, llego con las aguas y las chaves. But this guy's right here. I, like, I didn't put this, the effort, like he said. Yeah. Like, he can play, like, yeah. very good. Like, he, he... The way he builds the... the the game, the way, the way he's, you know, he positions himself. He can pull four people and they're in the nowhere. He can come around and, like, still have the ball. But, of course, then he comes Richie. Le mete <laughs> recaso y lo. But, however, I do have one. And I'm going to tell you right now. <laughs> and here. I mean, I've been, like, so. Saving this one? Yeah, I've been saving this one. I always tell him anyway. <laughs> you always tell me, man. So, you we're, we're always, we're always, we're playing, right? And then, I've been, you know what? I'm going to get, like, in very good shape. And I mean, like, I'm training hard. So one day I can outdo him in a play. And, the one, and I did it, like, one <laughs> play that I outdo him. And then I feel like a leg underneath me, and I'm flipping over, like, you know, two backflips and pa' abajo. Yeah. <laughs> I would have done the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> but, it, I mean, it's good, though, because we're always, for, like, it's, we're always very physical when we play. And we're always, like, trying to shake each other's hand at the end. But there's always, like, someone's toe getting stepped on. And with Koke right there, man, that guy's a beast. <laughs> I can't I, I can't confirm or deny any of that but uh I will say that I love playing we're, we're all very competitive we all push each other but uh, we definitely had did not have that drive and it, like almost insanity that you had growing yes. up yes, in training sure. you know I think that's what kind of differentiates <laughs> professionals versus you know us that we like to play every Tuesday, yeah. Thursday, Friday, Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> you you almost have to be kind of borderline crazy, crazy. about uh, like not yeah. crazy but obsessed yeah. almost. And like you said, you had to you got to have that other person telling you, you know, yep. pushing yeah. you. The support system. And, and, the yeah, support that's, system that's for probably sure. What, we miss cause oh. what about have, so you mentioned your mom? I mean, you mentioned your dad and your coach. What about your mom? Like, how does she feel about all this process of you guys playing? I think she thought at the beginning that we were wasting too much time. Mm. She was always like talking to my dad, like, no, you should de- stop wasting your time. Like go get more work or go do something else. <laughs> or, like go do something else. I know there are kids, but you're just wasting so much time in soccer and we don't have much time to do anything. We're always traveling and blah, 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 and blah, blah, blah. But I think once we started to get older, she went to every game too. Okay. She probably thought like, oh, okay, well, maybe they do have a chance mm-hmm. at making it. And she kind of started to believe. But I think at the beginning, she was like, y'all are wasting way too much time <laughs> doing this, playing some stupid game. Was she, was she, she liked sports too? Was she, did she play? No, she didn't play any sports. I mean, my grandpa had a soccer team, so she was around soccer. But maybe that's that was why it. I made it like <laughs> sick of soccer. <laughs> yeah. My grandpa was always doing something with soccer. <laughs> It was kind of like my 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 nephew Ethan. I would say he's he saw like me play. I mean, he nothing he can really see learn from. But I guess he saw like always playing, you know, or even a guitar or or playing soccer. Always thinking of soccer or or music. Always, always, always. And right now he's only thirteen, and he's like 
way better than what I was at his age, like guitar player wise or even soccer. And a lot of the times it's just, I tell them like a lot of the, you know, whenever the pandemic happened, everybody, you know, their schools were closed down and his team stopped training. Like this is the perfect time for you to work on your body. By the time you get to, you know, you're actually going to play in a game, you're going to be ahead of the game because you're going to be stronger, you're going to be faster, you're going to be, you know, and your mentality is going to be different because you're not going to be tired of not wanting to get tired. We're going to be more tired of, like, I don't want to lose this game. And literally not, man, he he kept training, and I saw him, like, not too long ago, I'm like, damn, dude, you got a six-pack, and he's, like, taller than me now. It's like, all right, dude. Tall, man. But yeah, I always, I think for me is if, if I were, like, what I've learned in life is you got to go and, you know, tienes que darle. Because if not, it's if you do something halfway, you're going to get halfway results. So if you want for sure full, if you're going if this is something that you extremely want, then you got to extremely put all the effort in and go 100%. Because if not, very few people are just naturally talented and stuff. Very few people just wake up and like, oh, I can, <laughs> I don't know, yeah. play the guitar amazing. <clears throat> no, I'm sure they practiced many a years mm-hmm. messy it's like one <laughs> no, that's, that's what I was gonna <laughs> he's, say. The, he's the best example of like a god-given talent that i'm sure he's still trained but he's just like blessed by god mm-hmm. and ronaldo's like the complete opposite yeah. the Machine. hard work what c- can hard work get you and it can get you almost the same or, or better results mm-hmm. but very few people just wake up and are like oh my gosh i'm just <laughs> naturally good at all this stuff like that just doesn't happen yeah, and I mean, you gotta, I mean, it's a training because even Messi, like, without the talent, right now the teams are more physical. Tiene que estar más fuerte, más, más rápido, o, o saber cómo administrar su energía. It's For sure. It's, even with all the talent he has, he still has to work hard. Yeah. But you can tell that he's gifted yeah, he has above a lot everybody else. <laughs> yeah. yeah. What do you think, okay? For sure, man. There's a bunch of things that we, uh, as, like, spectators, we don't see behind the scenes. We don't see all the hard work that gets done and all the sacrifices that are made. You know what I mean? Um, Sonny, I was, I, I'm kind of look, I looked at your tra- career trajectory and you've, you played in so many places at so many levels. Uh, very, very impressive resume. I'm wondering um, what were some of the key moments in, in uh, each time you, you went up to a different level or into a different um, type of competition um, in your career? That's a that's a good question. I think growing up, it was important to be told like you're not good enough, because that would send me back home to work harder. Um, kind of going back to like Wolfgang, and he would like I don't know. I got sent to the national team from like when I was twelve. So I got to see, when I was 12 years old, I got to see, before that, I was, I didn't play anywhere. I just played here in Austin and we maybe had gone to Dallas or Houston to see other kids, what other kids look like. But it wasn't like today where you could, I don't know, I think today more people just travel to play, but that wasn't the case. So when I was 12, I went to Massachusetts, to Boston, and they were supposedly like, the best hundred kids in the country there. And that's where I got to see Freddie Adu for the first time, who is supposedly younger than us, which I doubt. <laughs> um, and, and there was also, um, uh, what's his name? There was an Italian kid who ends up playing for Italy in the world cup, who was there. Giuseppe Rossi. I was going to say Rossi. He played for Manchester United. Mm -hmm. He was also at the camp. So it was like the first time that I got to see like, wow, there's these other kids that are way better than I am. Like I thought in my head, like, okay, I'm a good soccer player. But then when I went to these places, I was like, geez, these guys are still even like a step ahead. And then like trying to make the national team, they would always say like, oh, you know, you don't defend or you're not fast enough or you're not tall enough or you're not athletic enough to be on this team so it's like go home and either quit or try to prove people wrong and that was kind of just like always hearing like oh at the end of the level like oh you're not good enough 
okay, well, I'm going to keep working and keep working and keep working, keep working. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I was 18 and there wasn't like any professional teams like knocking on my door and I had to go to college. So I went to college. I went to the same school as my brother. And then that's like a long story in its own. But my dad was like, do you want to go try out for Santos after my freshman year? And I'm like, okay. So I go thinking in my head, okay, I'm going to go try out for a professional team. If you've ever been to Torreon pre the new stadium, where they trained at um, was a dirt field for the kids. Like if you weren't on the first team, the first team had two grass fields. Primera, which is like the second team, had half a field. And then everybody else was on dirt fields. So tryouts was on a dirt field with like sand all over the place and like the winds blowing and rocks on the field. And that's what it was. Um, so it's like, just kept like the, the nose were like something that kept pushing me to get better. But once you're a pro, the nose hurt more because there isn't, it's like your job. So it's either like the nose are saying like, okay, no, you're not good enough to play on this team. You got to go to this team mm -hmm. or no, you're not going to play over this player because he's way better than you. So you're going to be on the bench the whole year. Are you okay with it? Or you want to try and go find another team? It's tough. So the, the nose at the beginning help knows when you're on a professional team suck. And it's just mm -hmm. part of the game, I guess. Everybody at some point, I'm sure gets told, no, you just got to deal with it. Looking back at that, Sonny, what, what are some things you wish you could tell yourself 15 years ago when you were, when you were kind of experiencing some of these, uh, some of these difficult moments or other difficult moments in your career? I would have told myself not to worry as much like on the field, but just try and play as free as possible. Um, Were you pressuring too much? I, I was pressuring myself too much mm -hmm. to try and impress, impress because I was coming from like being the guy on the team where they just gave me the ball and they're like, okay, we want you to do something. But that's not how professional soccer is. Right. Like you're part of a team and there's other right. players that are very good at what they do. So you can't really have that attitude. Um, but that's kind of like the pressure that I would just put on myself. And if you just put pressure on yourself, you usually end up not playing very good. So I would have told myself, like, don't worry about anything. Just play your game. And I think I've it would have been maybe a little bit different of a story. Calmada la iguana. <laughs> exactly. That's crazy. I mean, but it's, yeah, it's it's a, a good thing that you still had that worried. I mean, because that helped you be relentless in some aspect. Now that you were saying, oh, like you could have been a little more calmer, more you know, relaxed. But I mean, I'm pretty sure it will be a different outcome, but it happens. <laughs> life i can't go back and change it i wish i would that's right. the only thing that i would have told myself but i'm definitely happy with everything i've done in soccer so far so then it's good to hear, after, man. after uh you said you're playing in uh, college right your brother played there too um and he finished playing four years i guess and you decided just to go to mexico and, and try for a for a, i guess a pro team yeah it's a, it's like another, another story, um, <laughs> going to college. So there wasn't another way to play professional soccer. I remember at the time when I was 18, there was like three players that were my age that had gone to the MLS and they were like unheard of that. They were going to pick kids from high school to go play in MLS. And there was like three kids that had signed in Europe, but there was no more than 10 people that were playing professional soccer at my age. And then everybody was like, my brother ends up going to a school called Campbell university, which mm -hmm. is like a tiny school in North Carolina, a D one school. And I had like these options to go to all these other schools. And they were like, why would you go to Campbell? But I told myself like, I don't care uh, if I'm good enough, like they're going to find me wherever I'm going to play. So it doesn't matter. Um, so I went to Campbell and I figured like, well, at Campbell, I'm, I'm going to get to play and I'm going to get to play with my brother. 
So Campbell wasn't a very good soccer school, um, mm. but we ended up doing really good. And my brother sc- scored the most goals out of anybody in all Division One schools. Dang. So he scored like 26 goals in a season, which he was up for like All-American and all these awards because he had scored so many goals that year. <laughs> um, and he ends up going all four years. He already had been there two years that was his third year and then when i left he stayed another year and then he played for um kansas city wizards for the wizards before they were sporting the kansas sporting city. kansas city i remember um, they had the little logo and it was like a ball <laughs> and then like a rainbow a looking rainbow yeah down. he did play after that though okay. where they had changed the rainbow they took the rainbow out um <laughs> so he was at kansas city and i it's like if I stay here for four years and I saw my friends kind of like already starting to leave, mm-hmm. I was like, if I don't leave now, I'm I'm gonna You're be not gonna leave. I'm never yeah. gonna leave. I'm gonna be held behind and playing. I already had seen kind of what college soccer was, and it was only soccer for six months, and then the other six months you were just training on your own because there wasn't anything going on. So I was like, No, there's no way I gotta get out of here as quickly as I can. Is that the reason that you wanna you wanted to go play in Mexico or or you just well, there wasn't anywhere to play here. They weren't going to pick up any. There wasn't anywhere to play. It either made the first team in the mm-hmm. MLS or that's it because there was no yeah. second. There was no Fuerzas Básicas mm-hmm. to it. So when I went and signed for Santos, I signed for Segunda, which is like the third team. But in the season that I got there, I had a crazy first six months at Santos. I played in Segunda. Uh, went to Korea with the national team, with the U S national team came back, went with the Mexican national team to Argentina. What? And I spent like a month and a half, like between those two trips gone, came back, got moved up to Primera played one game, five minutes in Primera. And then I got moved up to the first team and I debuted in six months on all of those teams. And I still got to play the last two games against Pachuca and against Cruz Azul for the first team for Santos at the first six months that I got there. Which, uh, which, uh, year was that? 2000, November 5th, November 6th, 2006 was my first game against Pachuca. Uh, so did you go, what, uh, when, when you went with the, uh, Mexican national team, what was it? Uh, the U20 or U20? U20? There was because there was a there was a tournament that was played after the like to the, it was in 2016. It was after they won the U17 World Cup, and I I remember I, I I remember your name like from way back then. It would have it to be like, way before that though. 2016, I'm already old. You're, It'd have to be 2007. Uh-huh. Was when the World Cup we were trying out to be. That's another story too. <laughs> when I go to Santos, the guy who's in charge of Fuerzas Básicas yeah. also is kind of like in charge of Fuerza, like Fuerzas Menores of the national team. He's like, you need to go play for Mexico. I'm like, but I've already been playing with the U.S. Why would I want to go play for Mexico? Yeah. He's like, no, you need to go. So that's when I went on all these trips. But Mexico had won the World Cup in 2005 with Giovanni mm-hmm. and Carlos Vela. Mm-hmm. It's like, why would they change anything because after that, the next world cup was the U 20 world cup. And it was going to be in Canada. And this whole time they were like choosing players, but Chucho Ramirez was going to be the same coach. Yeah. So of course he was going to take the, the same, same players yeah. because those are the players that won the world cup with him. Why would he take anybody else? Um, so he told me like at the very last trip, when we were going, we went to Argentina, like you're not going to be on, the team for the net for the world cup. But if you want to, we'll take you the Panam- Panamericanos because at that time it was like the same time and they needed two national teams to play. The 2011 yeah. Panamericanos. No, 2007. Seven Panamericanos. Panamericanos. Yeah, you're right. I'm, I'm way older. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> now I'm getting, I'm getting there. Those play, play those in Rio in, in Brazil. In Brazil. Yeah. Yeah. They okay. played those in Brazil. I'm thinking a, a couple of years. Yeah. I'm, I'm getting my, my time mixed up right now. So I, 
it's i look younger, chucho I'm chucho older. chucho told you that like about yeah but i, I was yeah. okay with that yeah i knew that that was gonna happen and i knew that they had won the world cup the the only there was only like five players that they took that weren't on that team that had won the world cup so and one of them was chicharito before he was chicharito he's just Javier Hernández. Hernández. Javier Hernández. Before he had the name. <laughs> yeah. Chicharito. And at the time, I was already on the list for like the last camp for the U.S. Before choosing, like they had to go from like 32 to 26 players to go to the World Cup. And I was already on the list. And they were like, you just need to confirm that you're able to go. And... Santos is like, no, you should go to the Panamericanos. And I was like, no, I don't want to go to the Panamericanos. I'd rather go to the World Cup. And I ended up not going to either <laughs> either Panamericanos or to the World Cup, mm-hmm. which I don't even know if I would have made the World Cup team, but at least I would have been like fighting Part of for that, a spot yeah. to be Part there. of the process. Yeah. yeah. So <clears throat> I kind of got screwed over and that part sucked a lot. I imagine that's like, tough, man. That's tough. Two options. That's man. interesting that that you had like both perspectives, like Mexican national team, U.S. national team. You were kind of getting tugged back and forth, and you ended up, you know, not really participating in like those major tournaments. But I'm sure uh, you took some experiences away from that. I mean, that's that's something that's pretty seems to be pretty unique to like the Mexican American experience as a as a as a player of your level. You know, that was before. Now it's common. Yeah. That was when it was very yeah. uncommon. Yeah. There was That's what I was going to say like was that allowed even allowed? It was allowed until you played an official tournament yeah. and the only official tournament was the World Cup. So anything that you went to was never Didn't counted matter. as official oh, okay. unless it was the Youth World Cup and then you kind of got stuck with that team. But yeah. there was only two of us in all of Mexico that were Mexican American when I was in Mexico playing. Mm-hmm. It was we we're on the same team. El Jomi Castillo from New Mexico was the only one that was American born and playing in Mexico. Besides um Edgar Castillo, right? Edgar Castillo. Yeah. yeah. I remember him. Like he went he played the qualifier to go to the 2010 World Cup. For USA. For well he played like he played for like played Mexico, for Mexico Olympics and yeah, the Olympics. Went to, like, for the uh, the pre El- 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 Olympico, whenever they didn't they make lost. it. And in 2008, I like that. I think after that, he decided to, you know what? I'm going to go to the USA. Like to the, the US. Yeah. That's, and then you were the other, the other player. That there was had. only two of us in all of Mexico huh. at the time. And for, so what I'm pretty sure the environment from Campo University or even like the US soccer and the Mexican soccer, it's completely different. Completely different. Um, you you went to Santos and tried out and how was the like back then you were saying you guys were playing like in dirt pretty much. What about the facilities where y'all stayed and and you know like whatever they were feeding you guys? How was how was that? It was tragic. <laughs> <laughs> the reason why I'm asking is because you're coming from from Austin from I'm pretty say a, a you know comfortable place you know you're Very you're your parents mm-hmm. so and then you were wow. at Campbell University you know even even you go to high school here sometimes you. No. It's not bad, yeah. But over there is like completely different. Oh my! <laughs> oh man! When we went to Trout, we stayed at the Casa Club, and it was awful. And then I said, "I don't care because I want to play." And when I signed, I had nowhere to live, so I had to stay at the Casa Club. Yeah, I had one bag, and it was like a motel. It looked like a motel. With like a swimming pool that had no water in the middle of it. <laughs> there were like rooms that had a bathroom in it and it just had bunk beds. So all the rooms had air conditioning except for mine because I was the last one to like show up to the Casa Club. Um, but- so I had my own room, but there was just a fan in Torreon, which is just as hot as Austin. And by like the third day, they had stole my my cleats. <laughs> my cell phone damn <laughs> everything like all, all give you a true welcoming yeah <laughs> all the cool stuff had, Save me some gone. <laughs> gone um the food was these two ladies that were super nice ladies would come breakfast was just like cereal 
or a barrita. And it was like, you either eat or you don't eat when you go to practice. And that was your choice. Lunch, they would come cook lunch, but they would make the same, like they would just make like a big olla of frijoles and arroz and one guisado. And that's what you ate at lunch. And then that's what you ate at dinner. So oh. they would just like pack it and like <laughs> recalentado. Recalentado. Oh, yeah. And they would leave. So there was nobody watching us except for this poli who didn't even watch us. <laughs> he was there. Estaba con su revista vaquero. <laughs> Probably. But they were still, like 15 years old to like 22, which is like, that's a oh, big yeah, gap. Yeah. Like 22 year olds aren't thinking the same thing as like a 15 no, year old. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah so they were already on a different page than a lot of us. Um, and that was like in the middle of the city and where we practice was like really far away. So it's like, how are we going to get to practice? And they're like, no, we get rides. And I was like, okay. So I just showed up when they said they were going to leave and we like st stuck our hands out and got like rides oh, to that where we wanted to go. And then if they stopped at the stoplight and they were going to go straight and we need to go to the right, we just jump off the back of the truck. Mm -hmm. So my parents didn't even know what they were sending me to because they were like mm. professional soccer. You're going to get paid. And here I am like asking for rides and getting all my stuff stolen. Um, <laughs> That's a story right there. We had one uniform uh -huh. and it, mine already was probably used because it was already faded <laughs> <laughs> and we didn't have a washer. So there was a how so like how oh, so thing. So and you literally like wash your clothes out and there's no dryer. So you just hung it at that swimming pool that was that had no water in it and you just hung your clothes out you went and got your clothes and you just went to practice after 15 days i'm like first paycheck i'm leaving yeah. the casa club i i don't want to be here anymore so i moved out <laughs> to the police mom's house she had like an apartment up at the top yeah. and i moved over there yeah and i told my parents mom like you're, you're gonna have to bring me a car because i can't be asking for like i'm not gonna be asking for rides yeah can't get to practice and i moved away from the casa club so i wasn't i had no one to help me like get around the city so that was what soccer looked like outside of soccer what uh what about your parents uh did you they they know all about this like what's going on at that time or did you tell them like after or later no they didn't care <laughs> <laughs> gonna, that was a one yeah, like, yeah. we signed up for yeah. <laughs> You agreed to this. You left your full scholarship and food and your yeah. dorm and all this nice stuff that you had to go over here and get all your stuff stolen. So you either try hard or you just come back home. And I was like, okay, well, I'll just try hard. <laughs> and it's funny because we're laughing here, but this is like, I would, like hard work right here, man. Like, yeah, that's crazy. It, Santos got a whole lot better. Now the stadium is <laughs> so nice and the, the facilities are like yeah. right next to the stadium and you don't have to leave. Really are. But... It was what? Uh, what year was that? Whenever two thousand six, two thousand six. I mean, so, if you think about it, it's not too too long ago. Yeah, I mean, it's like about fourteen years ago. Yeah. But well, actually, it's way, way more than, more than, than that. that. Yeah. So, so the, now the one thing is, it's <laughs> yeah, the, right there. <laughs> funny. It's like God. <laughs> the uh, hey man, I'm older than you, so no worries. <laughs> uh, the one thing is, I mean. Like now the stadium is nice, so I'm pretty sure they got a big investment, you know, and everything is different now. But back then, I remember La Corregidora, for me, when you look at it, part of it felt like a rancho, you know, like whenever you're playing and then it's like, what, they're playing here and then the stadium will be small. But you see Borghetti and Ponies like always doing their thing. No, the stadium, at least Santos, the stadium was small and like looked like it was falling apart. But it was completely packed and the fans mm -hmm. would go crazy for the team. The one thing I, I love about Santos, it's hard to find somebody in Torreón that doesn't go for Santos. Mm -hmm. If you go to other cities, like Chivas would come to Torreón at that time. I can't speak for now, but the stadium was all green. They didn't care it was Chivas. They didn't care it was America. They didn't care who was coming. It was all of our fans. You went to other stadiums, then I played for Atlante and Nobody would go for Atlante. Like whoever, if, if America came, the whole stadium was yellow. If she was came, played, uh, it was all red. Uh, you played came, Cancun? All blue in Cancun. Cancun. They didn't, nobody went for Atlante. So it's like, geez, nobody even goes for this team um, in, in Cancun. And, and Mexico City, there's a lot more Atlante fans. But in Torreón, everybody went for Santos and the whole, almost the, the whole stadium that 
would allow the home seating was filled with people that went for Torreon. So that was a, a good part of the being at Santos. That's good. Did you did you get to play with Pony Ruiz? Yeah. Oh, you did? Was Pony Ruiz before he left Santos. Osvaldo Sanchez, Ludueña, Matias Bozo, Cristian Benitez, Man, Oribe names, Peralta. Heavy names. heavy names. So I didn't get a lot of playing time, as you can see. <laughs> <laughs> you can see, you know, you Learning hear, experience. Hey man, experience. It's pretty cool. The one thing I was talking about is they were mean. <laughs> right. <laughs> like everybody was mean. Yeah. That Utilero yeah. was mean. The players were mean. They they were nice and mean at the same time. Mm-hmm. But every practice, for whatever reason, started with Lorito and everybody had a play. And a torito is like obviously the big circle mm-hmm. and three people are in the middle. <laughs> Whoever messed up would go in and the guy to the right and the guy to the left. If they did 20 passes on you, it's like blood was going to come out because they would hit you so hard. You would just have to like duck into like oh. a little ball because the players that were older would just come and like smack you in the head. Like didn't feel bad about it yeah. whatsoever. So people were like slide tackling each other <laughs> not to get the 20. Right. Because... You knew that you were going to get hit yeah. extremely hard. Dang. And that was a bad mood before yeah. practice even started. Like, do I have to play this game? I don't know. Yeah. That's like a icebreaker. Kind of pressure. <laughs> yeah. hey, For real. Yeah. Iron sharpens iron, man. They would throw, like, they would get their clothes all nasty and wet and just, like, chunk oh. it at you. And be, like, dodging clothes. You had to, like, take a shower and, like, make sure that nobody was throwing stuff at you like in the corner or just wait for them to all shower and then you go in because that's how it was back then. I don't know. People, no one was going to say anything to Pony Ruiz. No one was going to say anything to like the The older players. Nobody. If you went like the doc, my leg hurts. He's like, get out of here. You're not old enough to come over here. Like, (laughs) like, can I get a massage? Like massage? You haven't even played a hundred games. You're not getting a massage here. Like go back over there and massage yourself. And here it's like, <laughs> oh, my leg hurts. I see little kids. I, I like that's just the way that it is now. I like I <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. see little kids like getting massage. I'm like, mm-hmm. who are these kids? Like, yeah, this is yeah. not what we, <laughs> this is not how I grew up. Right? Yeah, that's <laughs> changed for, for sure. Changed, like, yeah, one hundred percent. Yeah, we even like say now, what do you? So you you saw that, and then in here in America, like in the U.S. How how is the treatment towards the players? Like whenever you play with the youth teams, I mean treatment here is always top notch. There, it's mean, but it makes you resilient to anything that can come. So I think, yeah, the American player overall is a lot softer than what you would see in another country because if that's the environment that they're growing up in they're going to be a lot more thick skin to whatever can come their way. And that's why Argentinians make it because if Mexicans are resilient, they're, I feel like they're even more resilient and Brazilians like kind of get out of poverty or whatever they're at. Mm -hmm. And just like, there's no other option but to play soccer. Mm -hmm. And that's why there's so many of them playing and they're all good at playing soccer. So I, there's a big difference, not saying that Americans are bad or whatever, but where you come from definitely shapes you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Cause I mean, over here, I think they're a little more like nice. Take care of yourself, yeah. you know, take care of each other. They yeah, worry guys. about you. <laughs> yeah. They worry about you. And yeah. I would in Mexico, I mean, even when we play, yeah, hey, we're always, I mean, uh, it's, it's, it's hard about, hard about the <laughs> always have yeah. that. Um, we have like a different kind of like mentality in a way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But I think, it's like for us, we're we're blessed. Like for you, you're blessed to experience both sides. Um, and as you were saying earlier, you were you know the only two players that were Mexican Americans that got to experience you know the American side. It could have been comfortable. Um, I'm pretty sure you could have gone to the MLS or in place here, but you were like, you know what, I'm gonna stay in Mexico because it it was just something different for you. I mean. Maybe right now things are different when it comes to the league and how it's played. But at that time, I felt like the Mexican league had more to offer to you than way more. I mean, those guys that were on my team, yeah. that team of right. Santos was one it's of the best. Pretty legendary. Yeah. Pretty legendary yeah. team. Remember to be that. 
a part of that and train with those guys and shoot with them and see them play and see how they thought. I got to see Lou Luenian, like his best La Chita, moment. La Chita. He was a mm -hmm. game changer. Osvaldo Sanchez. Chato had like eyes behind his head. He would almost never lose the ball. Yeah. Um, Christian Benitez was just like a powerhouse. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, yeah. Beast. Oribe, when he couldn't get minutes because he was going up against Christian Benitez and Matias Bolso, who was also like in his prime. Imagine. You could already tell that he was, he had the fake shot like down to the T. He would fake shot everybody out and he would score goals all the time, but so would Chucho and so would Bolso. So yeah. Yeah. he had More to like earn his too. stripes. Yeah. yeah. And even, even, uh, este, el Chato, el Chato Rodriguez, he was, Low key player, but super consistent. No, he is Mr. Consistent in the middle of the field. He's never lost the ball, always in the right spot, knew where to stand. And he wasn't very like big either. Mm -hmm. He's one, like a pretty small guy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Carlos Carino, who is also like kind of the same, but a lot more of like a fighter. So I had a lot of good teammates to to learn from and then in 2008 that's when Cuauhtemo came and they reinforced the team like in the Liguilla in the Liguilla when he got to come from like Chicago Fire yeah something like that <laughs> yeah I remember that, that was uh, for me Cuauhtemo coming back every every time he would come as a refuerzo is like just seeing him play you just awaken something different like soccer like in soccer you'd be like enjoying that moment I always love watching him even when I was playing against him I was just <laughs> Shit, <I'm playing> <laughs> let me hit him <laughs> let me, let me do him. something yeah <laughs> poke his ear or yeah, something no. but um what do you guys think hey i i mean that like you said just just i guess being around that guy that guy's uh you know the names and and, and just training and watching them i think that in a way helps you know and and i just think that that's that's one thing that you that we can never say something like that, you know. And you you can say, yeah, yeah, I trained with them. I even had a game or whatever with them. And that's unique, and I, I, that's pretty cool cool to to have. Okay. I'm interested to hear. You know, you you've spoken a lot about training and um, um, your your time at Santos, um, but you kind of have a have a storied career. You've been through uh, different teams like Atlante, Merida, Necaxa, Sinaloa. What what are some of the moments that you think stand out the most to you when you in your career in Mexico? I think there's not a the best thing I could say about my career. I think is that it's lasted for so long. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of players that were much better than I was that didn't even play as long as I have. Um, so for me to be able to just play and be a professional soccer player for the amount of years that I was able to do it, that would probably be my biggest success um, moments within my career. I mean, definitely playing my first game with Santos is a big deal. Um, at Medida, even though it was Primera, I was like 21, played almost every single game of every single minute. And we lost to Querétaro and PKs to go up to first division. So, and we beat Tijuana with like a much lesser team. Tijuana had a much better team than we did. Um, and we should have, could have, would have, I don't know what would have happened if Merida would have won the Ascenso at the time and beaten out Querétaro. I don't know what would have happened to my career. Um, at Necaxa, I did really good. Um, at Atlante, I had a lot of more minutes in Primera División than all the other teams. I got to play with under Piojo. I got to play La Liguilla contra Cruz Azul, both Ida and Vuelta. Um, I got to start the Vuelta game when we needed to like win. I got to play the whole game. Um, scoring against Rayados in the game um, at Sinaloa I got to play a lot until they changed coaches <laughs> then I didn't get to play so much um, but I think that's for your normal soccer player there's just a lot of up and downs Right. very rarely 
I mean, not very rarely. The, the good soccer players, I don't consider myself one of the good ones, will steadily have like s- solid performances. But there's a lot of professional soccer players that just a lot of up and downs because that's just yeah. the way the game is. I don't know. It's a tough game for it, sure. Yes. What do you think? What do you think you owe that longevity to throughout your career? You said you've you've, you've been through this game for longer than than other than other people have had their careers. But what do you what do you owe that longevity to? To not smoking, not drinking, and not partying so much. Nice. Well, boys, I, I think that's something we could all learn from. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. These you currently drink right now. I drink. No. I mean, not maybe like one of something, but very, 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 very rarely. No, aquí somos bien. Sí, sí. La... <laughs> no, es cierto, papá y yo no tomo yo pura agua. Tomo mucho yo pura mantra. <laughs> But... All the stuff you're saying is like super valuable to hear for someone that's like listening and, you know, at an early stage of their life, you know, hey, you're hearing it right here from the source, you know, someone that's been through that professional life. That's what it takes, you know. To play it long. Yeah. Something that's much better than I would and party a lot harder <laughs> and drink a lot. <laughs> <laughs> still more successful they just don't last that long yeah right right the I, body has a yeah. expiration date you know <laughs> yep for sure hi and thank you for listening to episode 26 of otra por favor episode 27 will be released next week as sony guadarrama will continue to share his anecdotes related to playing professional soccer in mexico his transition back to the u.s and roots football Please share this episode with your peers and subscribe to our YouTube channel and any platform you use to listen to our podcast.